Hello everyone, so today we'll be looking at the role of the MHC. I recommend you check out a previous lecture where we discussed the structure and I guess introduced the structure of the MHC and how it works. So I recommend that lecture before we come to this one. But again, here's a brief overview if you want to just take a look. We have our MHCs presenting an epi epitope peptide and this allows it to be presented to a T cell. And then we have our MHC 1 and 2 and we'll discuss this. So antigen processing and presentation, putting the MHC to work. So here's a good figure of different types of pathogens. So we have a cytosolic pathogen, intravesicular, and extracellular pathogen and toxins. So we can see kind of the process. So we have our pathogen degraded in the cytosol, peptides bind our MHC, presented to effector CD8 T cells, put on the outside of the cell, result in cell death. We have an intravesicular pathogen, so it's in comes in in a vesicle. These are class two effector CD2 T cells, which cause the activation to kill the extravesicular bacteria and parasites. Here's an example with a B cell, where the B cell will take in the pathogen from its antibody or B cell receptor, then it will present it to the surface with an MHC class two, and this will respond to a CD4 T helper cells and results in further activation of B cells circuit immunoglobulin to eliminate extracellular bacteria and toxins. So cells become targets for T-cell recognition when they present antigens from their either cytosolic, like we said, which is endogenous, or vesicular, exogenous compartments. And this starts the T-cell immunity. So just from terminology here, endogenous versus exogenous. So an exogenous antigen is, originates outside the cell. So here's an example of an endogenous antigen in a capsule. So it binds to the cell, cell takes it in, then presents it. So an endogenous antigen is something that's synthesized in the cell. So an example would be a virus which replicates. So the virus will infect the cell, replicate, and then leave. But our cell will also process some pieces of the virus and present it. So these viral proteins that are made inside the cell are endogenous antigens. And we'll have more detail later. So this is the pretty much the go-to figure here. This sums up the entire lecture, basically. So here we'll look at our class two, and then we'll look at our class one. And again, class two looks at exogenous, and class one is endogenous. So we'll go through these steps in detail. But yeah, come back to this figure if you just want to take a look. I'll leave it here for a little bit, if you need to pause it. Okay, moving on. So endogenous antigen is presented in association with class one MHC. Exogenous antigen, uses class two MHC. So why are there differences? Endogenous and exogenous antigens take up, take different, very, very different routes through the cell, which you can see in this figure. We can see here, they, they're not the same. So this endogenous and ex endogenous antigens are derived from distant cellular, distinct cellular compartments. So here we have our basic cell biology here, the different components of the cell. So there are two major intracellular compartments determine the route of the antigen processing. So our endogenous antigen is sampled from the cytosol. So the cytosol compartment communicates with the nucleus through pores and nuclear membranes. The exogenous antigen is sampled from the vesicular system, which includes the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, the endosomes, lysozyme, and intracellular vesicles. This system samples extracellular fluid via endocytosis or phagocytosis. This results in antigen uptake into the vesicles so here's our vesicles, and is involved in vesicles, and the material is also exported out. So we can see here. So fusion of incoming and outgoing vesicles is involved in antigen presentation and pathogen destruction. So here we have autophagosome. So these autophagosomes are also participate, and these take up cytosolic proteins for lysosomal degradation, contributing to the induction of tolerance to self-proteins and presentation of viral antigen from the cytosol but deliver them to the vesicular system. So they process as exogenous antigens. So we're gonna take a look at endogenous. So here's just a quick figure. Here's our plasma membrane, we have our cell. Antigen is broken down, presented by MHC. So endogenous antigens are presented by class one and activate CD8 T cells. So that's something to remember. Just one of those things that you're just gonna to have to remember. 
So an endogenous pathway is used by most cells. So this processes proteins produced inside a cell, while the exogenous pathway is used by antigen-presenting cells, which processes proteins brought in from outside the cell, like our viruses. We also have cross-presentation, which is unique in that, again, it's an exception to the rule. This shows exogenous antigen entering the endogenous entering the endogenous processing pathway and being presented by class 1 MSC. So here's a unique system. So endogenous proteins, like viral proteins made inside a cell, after the synthesis are directed to proteasomes. So here's a figure of the proteasomes. Here's our viral peptides. The proteasome breaks down the proteins into short 8 to 10 amino acids alone, which we discussed earlier about needing to be small enough to bind into the binding grooves of the MHC. So the next step involves, so the processing of endogenous antigen involves a peptide transporter called TAP. This is a very important protein, as we can see here, TAP1 and TAP2. This is released from the proteasomes and goes to the endoplasmic reticulum. So in the endogenous pathway, these proteins are broken down into peptides in amidoproteasomes. So that involves our aminoproteasome right here and transported by TAP, so TAP is a transporter protein, transports peptides to the endoplasmic reticulum. So how do proteasomes work? So a proteasome is a cylindrical complex of proteases and binding proteins. It has a 20S core and two 19S regular, regular caps at either end, which bind ubiquitin tagged proteins. So ubiquitin tagged Cytosolic proteins are recognized by the 19S caps and are taken in and degraded into short peptides. So here's our ubiquitin binds to the protein. This is then taken into the protease and broken down into these small peptide fragments. So we see here the structure of the proteasome where their cytosolic proteins are degraded by the ubiquitin proteasome, which is the right here, system into short peptides. And these are then taken by TAP into the endoplasmic reticulum. Aminoproteasome, so another look at these. So here's a pretty complex figure looking at the proteasome. So if you want to slow it down and take a look, you can. So this proteasome can be induced by interferon gamma, which we've talked about quite a bit in our innate immunity. So interferon gamma results in improvements to the regular proteasomes. It helps replace certain proteasome proteins in the beta subunits. So we can see here there's different beta and alpha. So in our beta, with others that change that change proteolytic specificity of the proteasome. So the advantage of the immunoproteasome it results in increased production of peptides that bind well to TAP, which are transporter and class 1 proteins. This changes the proteolytic peptide cleavage patterns to generate peptides with optimal binding to the both MHC and the TAP1. This increases the rate of peptide release from the proteasome. And again, interferon gamma can also induce class 1 MHC expression. So there's synergy for improved antigen presentation through this route. So interferon gamma both helps the proteasome process these peptides and also causes increased expression of MHC, class 1, importantly. So here we can see interferon gamma also in induces binding of the PA28, which is a proteasome activator complex. So this proteasome activator complex, stimulated by interferon gamma, increases the rate of peptide release from the proteasome and changing protein cleavage patterns so that class 1 preferred anchor residue peptides are produced. So interferon gamma plays an important role. And again, it's one of those examples of innate affecting adaptive immunity. So this proteasome releases these peptides into the cytosol. So here we can see. These peptide transporter, or the TAP, these TAP transporters are associated with antigen processing. These transport peptides released from the proteasomes into the ER. There are multiple alleles of TAP and variation between individuals and peptide transport presentation, and there's also some disorders in TAP as well. Endogenous pathway, we see proteins are broken down into peptides and aminoproteasomes and transported by TAP into the ER. So again, we've seen this repeat, but these are key fundamentals that we need to get down. So as we discussed, there's both TAP1 and TAP2. There's a dimer in endo so TAP1 and TAP2 a dimer in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. These actively transport peptides into the ER. So here's the dimerized shape. They are cytoplasmic domains of TAP bind to the hydrolyzed ATP 
bind and hydrolyze ATP to provide energy for peptide transport. So TAP is a heterodimer of two polypeptides, one and two. Again, there's individual variation in TAP proteins, which can contribute to variations in antigen processing activity. So some people can, I guess, have better processing than others. So here's essentially the entire process. And it can be quite complex, but we'll get to it at some point. But yeah, this is a full process of endogenous enhancing. So essentially, we're going to slice this figure essentially into these components and we'll go through it in the next slides. But again, if you just want the whole picture at once, which I can totally understand, kind of a better visual, just take a look at this and follow the figure. So in our first step, the proteasome is busy preparing peptides for tap transport. But meanwhile, back in the ER, we have class 1 MSC proteins are being made. These are held in the ER, so here's our formation. They're being held in the endoplasmic reticulum in partially folded state until they associate with peptides. There are several chaperone proteins, so we've seen these before, and they're involved in stabilizing the class 1 MHC. So here we got a color-coded yellow. Again, here's our stabilizer beta-2 microglobulin. Here is a calnexin, which we'll discuss right now. And these are associated with cal chaperone calnexin. And this is there until the beta-2 microglobulin binds and then disassociates from calnexin. So again, this is stability, so this is kind of giving it that st stabilization in the meantime. So next, we have our class 1 and beta-2 microglobin form, which interacts with the peptide loading complex, which is the PLC. So the PLC, the peptide loading complex, contains three things, or calrecticulin, tapasin, and ERP57. So calrecticulin is a chaperone, Tapasin bridges TAP to the class 1 MHC molecules, while ERP57 stabilizes and is involved in peptide loading. And then again, TAP delivers proteins to the class 1 MHC. Here we can see binding of mitre 2 globulin causes the release of the calnexin, which is that chaperone that we saw earlier. So here we get our beta 2 in, calnexin out, and then we can see our CL complex, PLC complex of calreticulin, ERP57, and tapasin. We also have TAP. So now we're going to go into peptide editing. So these peptides are transported to the ER by TAP, as we said. These are transported peptides are tested for binding affinity with the class 1 MVC. So they kind of go through a natural selection process here. This also results in peptide editing processes. So if, the, if they fit the peptide binding groove, this will result in higher binding affinity, and this will stabilize the class 1 MVC molecule. Class 1 MVC is that bind peptide disassociated from TAP. So once it realizes it can have this binding, TAP will be removed. So here you can see our peptide loading complex is involved in peptide editing. It involves an exchange of low affinity peptides for higher affinity peptides. So essentially, this is a bunch of peptides from the different pathogen we broke down. So we'll see here. So let's just say this one with a little string binds in. No, it's not that it has less affinity than just a circle. So our system will choose the one with the highest affinity, meaning that it will now have the one that initiates a stronger immune response and greater binding. So now we look at peptide trimming. So improving the fit of the peptide for class 1 MRC. So the endoplasmic reticulum aminopeptidase, or the ERAP, as we can see here, and we saw in the other figure here, here's our ERAP. You can see it trimming, cutting off the little piece. Trims peptides that are too long to fit in the peptide binding groove of the class 1 MRC. As we discussed, the MRC molecules have small binding grooves, so we need amino acid or peptide lengths to fit in those Standards between MHC2 and MHC1. And as we discussed, MHC1 has a smaller binding group. So ERAP removes amino acid sequences, creating 8 to 10 amino acid peptides with improved fit for the class 1 MHC group, as it was called the closed group, as we discussed earlier. So now we have success, we have our binding, and now it will be transported. So the MHC class 1 protein and antigen peptide complex is exported and presented on the surface of the CD8 T cells, two CD8 T cells, sorry. And class 1 MSC proteins that do not successfully bind peptides are returned to the cytosol for ubiquinization and degradation in the proteasomes. So if it doesn't work out, they are destroyed. The usual outcome of endogenous antigen presentation by class 1 MSC molecules results in the interactions between cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CDLs, or CD8 T cells, 
and a target cell or antigen presenting cell. So again, here we can see class 1 MIT presenting peptide, T helper cell, cytotoxic T cell comes in, deals with it. So the T cell receptor recognizes the complex of antigen and MHC, as we can see in this animation. We also have co-receptors that interact with the MHC proteins. We have our cytosol T cells, which bind to class 1 MHC, and the result is an activated CDL in the action, and we involve our action and surveillance, which involves our memory. And then with CD8 T cells, we have death of the target cells. They kill the cell that they recognize. So a major histobatomic complex or MHC class 1 molecule on an antigen presenting cell presenting a peptide epitope to a naive CD8. CD8 lymphocyte making having a matching T cell and CD8 on its surface. Here we can see here it has a proper configuration, strong binding with the MHC1 and T cell receptor. So many viruses produce immunoevasins that interfere with antigen presentation by class 1 MHC. So this is where we talked about NK cells and their activity in certain pathogens, but a lot of cells are able to avoid this. And this is where a T helper cells are so important. So again, here's just a bunch of examples. So we have a herpes simplex 1. So here, example, it blocks the binding of TAP, which we saw was an important transport protein. Sorry. This blocks, again, blocks the entry to the ER. Human cytomegalovirus blocks TAP and ATPase. Again, inhibits that. So you can see TAP is involved in a lot of, seems to be targeted quite a bit. We also have a bunch of other viruses, or so adenoviruses, which is a competitive hinder for tepsacin. So again, part of that complex. So yeah, if you want to take a further look at this, you can take a look, we'll move on. So viral immunoevasins that can escape from class 1 MSA presentation. So there can be blockade of peptide entry into the ER. So herpes simplex virus 1 protein, or ICP-47, prevents peptides from binding to TAP in the cytosol. So we can see here, part of the herpes virus, blocking TAP. So here we can see it blocks that and messes up our immune response. We have cytomegalovirus, which blocks ATP-dependent transfer of peptides through TAP. So here we can see, cannot get through. Sneaky viruses. <laughs> so now we're going to look at these, the retention of MEC class 1 and the endoplasmic reticulum. So essentially prevents them from being expressed on the surface. And we'll see here, tapsin is inhibited. So we can have class MHC1 retention in the ER. Viral proteins bind to the class 1 MHC and prevent it from leaving the ER. So example is adenovirus, which binds to the MHC molecules and retains them in the ER. E19 also competes, so we can see here E19, competes with tapsin and to prevent its association with the tap protein. And this prevents peptide loading onto the MHC. Essentially, it blocks off TAP, not, not allowing that complex to form, so our TAP can't work. And our MHC molecules without peptide do not go to the cell surface and are broken down instead. So essentially, we cannot send the warning signal that the cell is under attack. So again, adenovinus E19 retains class 1 MHC molecules in the ER and prevents peptide binding or loading. So another example, we can also target class 1 MHC for destruction. So viruses can also destroy MHC, which is not good. So example is murine herpes virus MK3 protein, which interacts with the TAP and tapasin complex, which adds a ubiquitin subunit to the class 1 MSC molecule. So as we discussed, ubiquitin tag stuff to go on the proteasome. So now that it's tagged with ubiquitin, our MSC will go into proteasome and be broken down, just like we did with the viruses, with other viruses. So this NK3 is a ubiquitin ligase, which adds ubiquitin to the cytoplasmic tail of the class 1 MSC, as you can see here. The result is that it's tagged for destruction in the class 1 MSCs, go into the cytosol and are degraded by the proteasome. So again, here's that big figure. So we kind of summed up our endogenous antigen process here. So again, our intracellular antigen, antigen processing to peptides in the proteasome. Here's our proteasome. You see it broken down. There's peptide transport into the endoplasmic reticulum by TAP. Then we have peptide binding by the MHC using the complex, peptide loading complex. Then we'll have the MHC molecule will be presented on the cell surface. So again, guys, that's for MHC1 today. So next time we're going to be looking at MHC class 2. 
and the endogenous antigen process. So I hope you learned something. It's pretty interesting. And I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you next time.